factions, NBA, drunkenness, carousing, and et cetera, et cetera. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Can we give it up for Glenn? A sower without the sow. Casting the seeds far and wide. Generously, profusely sowing the seed. Some of the seed fell on rocky places, grew up very fast, and fell over. Some of the seed landed in the thorns, and the thorns, the worries of life, choked out the potential of the seed. Some of the seed was immediately snatched off the path by the birds, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. But some of that seed landed in the good soil. <laughs> and it grew, and it grew, it produced a crop, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Jesus tells us a story about a sower casting seed and the seed landing in all different kinds of places, and the seed is really the soil of our hearts, Right? Some of that seed lands uh, uh, in our hearts for a while and we get all excited about Jesus and then because we're not rooted, we fall. Some seed gets in the rocky places, the thorns, the thorns choke out the worries of life, the riches of the world, the things of the world choke out the, the seed. Some seed is stolen away by the enemy, Jesus tells us. There are people in this room who have all different kinds of soils in our hearts. But some of you are here because that seed landed in good soil. Amen. And it's growing and growing and growing. Jesus loves this uh, agrarian imagery of seeds and sowers and, and, and fruit and vineyards and wheat and tares growing up together in the field and harvest. Jesus tells us another story about a tree in a field. And the owner of the field keeps coming to the tree looking for fruit and saying, where's the fruit on this tree? Tear this thing out of the ground. It's not bearing fruit. And the field tender comes along and says, no, don't, don't tear it out of the ground yet. Let me fertilize it. Let me cultivate it. Let me fruit it and see if it grows fruit. Give you three years with it and see if it'll produce. There's a similar theme in all of Jesus' parables about vines and vineyards and seeds and sowers. And the idea is that our life is going to produce fruit. And the seed, uh, as Matthew tells us, that seed is the Lagos Basilion. It is the, the word of the kingdom. That seed is the, the gospel, is another word. The Evangelion, the, the, the good news. This is a word that was used by the Romans to proclaim Caesar's good news. Caesar's uh, reign over the earth. But Jesus takes up that very language of good news to talk about the kingdom of God that's coming into the earth. That good news has been planted in our hearts. But there's an expectation that when that good news is planted in the soils of our hearts, that it will produce fruit, a harvest of righteousness. Amen? Amen. Paul tells us what that fruit is supposed to look like in Galatians 5. What is that fruit that our lives are supposed to bear when the gospel, the good news of Jesus, which is a person, by the way, and the good news is that 
Jesus has put on flesh to save us from ourselves, to relieve us from the bondage of guilt and shame and sin, to set us free to live a fruitful life. Can I get an amen? Amen. Paul tells us what those fruits are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, generosity, self-control. That a life in which the gospel has been planted in the souls of our heart will bear that kind of fruit. Now, we all know that fruit doesn't just grow overnight, though, right? Uh, it, it, it takes some, uh, typically doesn't grow overnight, it, it takes some cultivating and some fertilizing and some pruning and some tilling. In fact, we need to do some gardening for our lives to produce some fruit. Amen? Uh, we need to do some gardening to cultivate the life of that seed so that our lives are fruitful, full of those fruits of the Spirit. In fact, to live a fruitful life, it takes a constant garden. Over the next several weeks, we're going to look at this uh, sermon series. We're going to talk about those fruits and look at some practical ways of how do we grow those fruits in our life and how do we prune off the things that need to be left behind in our life. How do we cultivate that seed of the good news in our hearts so that it produces a kingdom fruit? I came to tell you this morning about the constant garden. Grab your Bibles. We're going to need them this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is a light into our path. It is a mirror that shows us who we are. It is a revelation of God that shows us who you are. And so we pray this would not be simply time of just another church service. But we come humbly seeking an encounter with you. We ask that you would cause these words to burst forth from their ink cage and live and dance with us in incarnate ways. We ask the Holy Spirit that you would give us the strength to not simply be hearers of the word only, but doers also. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Sometimes bad Christians happen to good people. <laughs> Slap your neighbor and ask him, are you a bad Christian that happens to good people? <laughs> Sometimes I hear some stuff. Has it ever uh, made you curious that there are literally hundreds of people that come to this church campus every week? They fill the rooms of this church. Many of them come for the same reasons that we come here on Sunday morning. They're seeking a relationship with a higher power. They want to have community and friendship and fellowship. They want to learn spiritual practices, how to pray and how to grow. They come here for the same reasons that we come here. They may not even have the name of God right yet. But their faith and their belief in this higher power, something they can transform their life, and that desire that they want their lives to be transformed is enough that they can live their lives free of alcoholism and addiction or shopping or whatever their hurt habit or hang up thing might be. And those same people will not darken the door of our church in the Sunday morning. Have you ever thought about that? You know, we talk a lot about the nuns, the largest growing re religious group in the United States, the NLNEs, those that have no spiritual affiliation, no religious, none on survey data, right? But there's another group that's growing really, really fast and rapidly. It's called the nuns. Yeah. And those are the ones who once used to practice a religious path but don't anymore. The nuns are the ones that maybe used to be Christian and are not. And they're a, a large group of people. And I sit in those rooms and I hear those stories of nuns. I hear the horror stories of people that represented the church that deeply hurt them. I hear the horror stories of the bad Christians who happen to good people and who say, I'll never go to church again. This is really unacceptable. And it's what happens when we make our faith about what we say we believe, and that has no connection to how we actually live and treat people. Amen. This is how you can have millions of people in the United States because someone says that they're Christian. Their behavior doesn't matter. They can be the most repulsive, anti-Christian, hateful, bigotist person we've ever met. And if they say they're a Christian, we excuse their behaviors because of what they say they believe. But this is not 
gospel, this is anti-gospel. This is not Christian. This is not, this is anti-Christian. And in fact, this is what Paul's trying to tell us in Galatians 5, where he's given us this wonderful, beautiful hope that we have as followers of Jesus, that we have freedom. Like real freedom for the first time in our life. It's interesting uh, to me that the first time that I ever experienced freedom was in the confinement of a solitary cell. That's where I came to know what true freedom is was because that's where God set me free from the prison I was living in long before I was ever in that cell. Amen. And Paul talks about this freedom that we have that, that, that's the freedom to truly live a life that God intended us for us to live. And Paul with his uh, kind of flagrant metaphors that he likes to use, he says if you want to go ahead and put yourself under the law and be bound by the law and live a life under the law, go ahead and do that. If you think the circumcision is going to save you, why don't you go ahead and, and emasculate yourselves all the way, Paul says. <laughs> Paul's a little bit of an extremist. Okay? <laughs> Just cut, cut it all the way off. You think you're going to... You think that the law is going to save you. This is, this is what's in the Bible. Y'all should read it sometime. Uh, <laughs> If you want to put yourself under that bondage that you're trying to earn your way into a relationship with God, you go ahead and do that, but Christ has given you this invitation to a life that's true, like in freedom, real freedom. Freedom like maybe some of us have never known in our lives, that kind of freedom. And he says, really, it all boils down to this. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. So what we're going to talk about the next several weeks is not about trying to earn our way into a relationship with God. It's not trying to, uh, by the law and by works, trying to somehow, you know, earn our salvation. That's a really bad plan. Don't even try it. Make it in. What we're talking about, though, is that when that gospel has been planted in your heart, when you have this freedom that you have in Christ, your character... The, the nature of your life is going to be transfigured. Yes. Amen. And it's going to bear some certain fruits. Amen. Because God has called us His beloved and He's called us into this family. And we're already seated at the right hand in the heavenly places of Christ. At least one person got excited about this. Uh, that means we now have to take on the character of our family and our Father. We have to, to, to reflect the, the, the nature and the behavior of our, of our heavenly Father. And Paul talks about it like this. Live by the Spirit. Later he's going to say, this is walk by the Spirit. He's going to say, uh, Zoe uh, Numa. Life in the Spirit. That's the free life. That's the true life. Life in the Spirit. Just hold that in your heart for a minute. What does it look like to live life in the Spirit? And if we do that, we won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires and opposes the spirit, what the spirit desires and opposes the flesh, these two things are at war. There's a spiritual warfare going on. Uh, and our struggles are not against flesh and blood. They're not against other people. That's Amen? Right. Uh, no matter what we think about those other people, or what their views might be, or whether we agree with them or not, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Amen? Amen. Uh, our struggle is against those spiritual forces and the struggle in our own souls. Yes. Paul says, what a wicked man that I am. I know what I'm supposed to do. I don't do it. I'm supposed to do these things. I don't do those. Right? He talks about the struggle that we're having. That, that literally inside of us, there, there's a war that life in the spirit, we, we all have this bent to sinning, we all have these proclivities and these isms, and every single one of us has them, yes. uh, that, that the spirit is trying to, to give us the power and the real life to overcome those things so that we reflect Jesus. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. You're not trying to earn your way. You're not trying to be good enough so that God will love you. You already know that God first loved us so that we could love God and each other. And now the works of the flesh are obvious. I mean, even little children 
can see these behaviors and say, that's wrong. It is just instilled in us. We, God put it in us. Nobody even has to teach us. The works are this. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, fractions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Paul said, I could go on, but let's pick them on. But these kind of things. Now, Paul's not talking to people outside the church. He's talking to church folks. This letter is to church folks. Did you know that? Can you believe that you, you can have a church where there's idolatry, people are putting other things on the third of their hearts besides God, and sorcery, and enmities, and strife, and jealousy, and anger, and quarrels, and dissensions, and factions, and envy? Can you believe people would be doing that in a church community? Yes. No. Never? <laughs> Actually, it happens in every church I've ever been a part of, and it's happening right now in this church. Right now. Amen. And Paul said, this is not the life that is truly life. This is not life in the Spirit. This is not how followers of Jesus who have the gospel planted in our hearts are supposed to behave in that. And I'm warning you, as I warned you before, Paul says, I've had to say this many times. So apparently this is a recurring thing in churches. Can you believe that? Uh, that such people will not inherit the kingdom. Now, when somebody loves you, they tell you the truth, right? Yes. And this is true. If you love somebody, you don't lie to them and deceive them. Whether the truth is hard to hear or not. And this is, this, this is true. In fact, Paul says it a lot more nicely than Jesus does. Jesus goes mafia boss on us. And, says, <laughs> and Jesus says, if anyone causes one of my little ones, my mathatas, one of my disciples to sin, if anyone has these kind of behaviors and, and knock people off course and, and cause harm to other people and call themselves my followers and they're harming other people, that person should have a millstone tied around their neck and be thrown into the sea and they should be suffocated and drowned all in the same moment. Right? Jesus goes, mafia boss. But because Jesus loves us, he tells us the truth. Mm -hmm. yes. And we Wesleyans, we have this simple little thing that we say, do all the good you can, and all the ways you can, to all the people you can, and all the places you can, and do no harm. Because when bad Christians happen to good people, when our actions turn people away from Jesus Christ, when our character and our attitude harms other people, we've, we've got some reckoning coming with God. Amen. Now, let me just frame that and say, Jesus likes to use hyperbole. He likes to make his point in that way. He likes to use drastic metaphor and say, I'm serious about this. Right? Don't hurt people. You're my followers. But in contrast, by contrast, so here's the good news. The good news is the fruit of the Spirit. Is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things, there is no law. You can be as loving and joyful and peaceful and uh, generous and patient and self-controlled as you want to be. There's no law. There's no limits. You, you can do that as much as you want to do. Amen? And when we see those kind of fruits in our life, we seek to be those kind of people. Paul's saying that's what freedom in the spirit is like. It doesn't mean that we're all going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're all going to have all the fruits all the time. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're off the hook on that. Okay? We all are. None of us are going to have all the fruits and bear those all the time. We're in a, we're in a journey of, of, of growing in fruitfulness. There's no law against such things. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Here's some more good news. We can't change by our own strength. It doesn't matter how much effort or how intentional we are. We cannot work this change in our own hearts. That's why we need grace. That's why we need faith. 
Because only God can do that. Right? Only God can transfigure us from the inside out and make our lives bear fruit. Good word, good word. So let us not become conceited, competing one against one another and envying one another. Right. The church is not a place to compete and be jealous and yeah. quarrel and start fractions and gossip and do all these things. Paul's saying, yeah. look, pay attention, folks. This is not the way that followers of Jesus behave. Yeah. This is not the kind of fruit that, that is supposed to come out of our life. He sets before us really two kinds of fruit. There's the fruit of death. And people are going to eat that fruit off your tree. And there's the fruits of life. That people are going to eat the fruit of life that comes off your tree. And we all have to make a choice. So I've got one slide here. I'm going to, as we kind of walk through these over the next several weeks, uh, we're, we're really looking at four different branches. Of the tree. Let's say that gospel's been planted in your heart. It's the tree of life growing in your soul. Uh, and there's four branches here. Sacrificial living, that's love and generosity. Each one of these things kind of related together, right? Uh, the gracious living branch, that's about gentleness and kindness. Those are kind of interrelated. Uh, satisfied living is about patience and joy and peace. Uh, and devoted living is about faithfulness and self-control. And I'm going to go ahead and cover that devoted living branch this morning, faithfulness and self-control. And let me share this with you. Faithfulness is a good place to start because faithfulness always precedes fruitfulness. Can you say that with me? Faithfulness precedes fruitfulness. Until you can be faithful in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're never going to be fruitful uh, as his follower. The essential thing about being people whose lives are right through the Spirit is our relationship with Jesus. Now the word peace, faith, uh, is really about believing things, uh, the hope of things that have not yet uh, come. It's about having faith in God in all situations, in all scenarios. And that word faithfulness is about being a person who exemplifies that kind of faith, right? So when we think about faithfulness, faithfulness, uh, we're supposed to be faithful people, loyal people who are faithful in our relationships with each other. We're faithful in our relationship with God. We're faithful in our relationship with our spouse. We're faithful in our relationship with our children. Faithful people, uh, that's the kind of people that are followers of Jesus. And the number one centerpiece of our faithful lives is our faithfulness to Jesus Christ and our relationship with Jesus. And you know what that, that means and what that takes? For a relationship to grow? Time. Yes. Communication. Amen. Talking to Jesus. Spending time with Jesus. Praying. Reading the scriptures. Devoting ourselves to worship of Jesus. Uh, Jesus has to become the center and the focus of our lives. And from that place of faithfulness will spring forth fruitfulness. Right? Amen? Are y'all waiting so far? Faithfulness. Now, you know what faithfulness is. It's kind of like what we do in our wedding vows, right? For those of us who've been married or maybe you've heard wedding vows, uh, till death do us part, to love, honor, and cherish, uh, 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 ignoring all others, coming together through the, the highs and the lows, through sickness and health. That's about faithfulness, right? And people that follow Jesus, our lives should be right with the fruit of faithfulness. Now, this next one, I think it's kind of funny that I ended up with it, self-control. Because it's the fruit that I've struggled with my whole life and still struggle with today. Amen? How are there any self-controlled people struggling with self So, actually, I mean, self-control is kind of the antithesis of what alcoholics and drug addicts have. Uh, it's the opposite of self-control. We don't have that. Uh, in my whole life, it was anybody says, you can't do that. Well, I'm going to do it just because you said I can't. You won't jump off that thing. I'm going to jump off of it just because you challenged me to jump off of it. Uh, that tastes good. Let me drink it. That smells good. Let me smoke it. That looks like a good idea. Let me try it. That's a lack of self-control. That's just following the desires of our flesh in an unchecked way, doing whatever we want to do, uh, and that leads to death. Uh, and so this is one of those things, it's one of those fruits that I, I have to constantly garden in my soul, right? Because still to this day, I struggle with this. We're going to sit in three-hour meetings that should be done in 20 minutes, and my leg is shaking and I'm going to jump out of the meeting. Yes. Uh, Self-control is about 
having the control to say, I don't have to jump off that thing. I don't have to smoke that thing. I don't have to drink that thing. And leaning into the power of the Holy Spirit, I can do that, right? Self-control really is, is kind of anchoring our spiritual lives because if we're going to choose the fruit of death, we're going to choose the fruit of life, that comes down to a self-control issue, right? And Jesus talks about weakness, and we're going to learn more about that fruit later. But meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth, but meekness is not about weakness. It's having the strength to have some self-control. Strength under control. Right? So everything really comes down, life in the spirit, um, to a choice that we make. With every thought and every interaction and every relationship that we have, we have a choice. I can choose to be a generative person, have a generativity mentality, or a scarcity mentality. And all of us, depending on our childhoods and how we've been shaped and formed and the things that we've been through, we're going to have different fruits that are going to be harder for us and different ones that are just going to come easy for us. Some of those fruits are just going to be part of our natural disposition. Some of them are really going to be a struggle, right? Amen. So if you've been raised in a situation where you had great parents, you had everything you ever wanted, they made sure that you were taken care of, you have a generativity mindset. There's always enough and you want to be a person who multiplies and you think about generations. And think about really people beyond yourself. That's generativity. Scarcity is there's never enough. There's never going to be enough, so i got to get mine. So if you grow up in a situation where you have go days where you don't eat, or you have to steal to have the things that you want, you're going to have a little bit different of an attitude and a mentality. Amen? Amen? So that's something that the Holy Spirit has to heal and give us strength to transform out of. We shouldn't continue to go through life in a scarcity mentality. And we have to, first of all, become conscious of it, inventory what's really going on in our souls. And then rather than reacting to every little thing that happens, we respond. And that takes all the rest of the fruits, like patience, uh, to respond and not react. To not just jump out of whatever my impulse is, but to think of what is the Holy Spirit calling me to do in this situation. To, to lean into that power of the Spirit and, and ask God what God's calling me to do in that situation. Right? All of this comes down really, I could be a negative person or I could be a positive person. You may be wired to be a glass is half empty person, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be a glass is half full person. Right? That's really a choice. It's acknowledging that this is how I think, this is how I feel, and asking the Holy Spirit to transform those parts of me. We can give God our first fruits, or we can give God our leftovers. Yes. We can be generous people, or we can be stingy people. And you can justify that and come on at it all kinds of ways to justify what you do, but that's a really simple one. You can tell where your heart's at on that. Just look at your checkbook. It's really simple. It's the first check that you write, the first fruits of your harvest to God, or do you give God your leftovers? Do you give Him the leftovers after you go out to eat all the month, after you buy all the clothing that you want and the things that you want to pay your golf membership or whatever that might be? And then, right? Are we going to give God our first fruits or are we going to give God our leftovers? And if you want to give God your leftovers, that's fine, but you're going to live the leftovers kind of life. I know y'all don't say anything to do that. <laughs> right? So all this is about self-control is about having that, that choice and, and drawing our strength from the Holy Spirit um, to not do things the way that we used to do. To be people that, that take on the character and the heart and the behavior of Jesus. And so this is, this is what it means really to be a follower of Jesus. And this is what it means... To, to have a real faith, not simply we just intellectually assent to this is what I believe, but that belief is shaping and transforming my life and not creating a wake of duns as a, as a, a bad Christian who happens to good, good people. I want to conclude with just a, a couple challenges for you this week. Um, we need a gardener in our life. Um, this is not easy stuff. This is, this is, uh, takes energy and effort. If we have a garden, uh, things like to grow up in the garden. Weeds, uh, things like to come in and steal our fruits. So we have to care and to till that garden. Here's the amazing thing about what the church is supposed to be. 
It's supposed to be a place of constant gardeners where we can come together and, and push each other and, and call out the best of those fruits in each other uh, with honesty and humility and love, speaking the truth in love, we can call out uh, the cultivation of those fruits. Uh, and so I want to just invite you to do this big, hairy, audacious challenge this week. Find a couple people in your life that you really trust, family, friends, um, loved ones, people that have a spiritual uh, a sense of things and a maturity, and just ask them this simple question. How do you experience me? How do you experience me? If you really want to challenge yourself, ask your spouse that question. <laughs> the closest people in your life. How do you experience me? Don't try to shape the response or, or, or uh, you know, manipulate that. If they say, what do you mean by that? I'd say, you know, if you have to describe it in just a couple words, uh, how you experience me as a person. Be careful, Billy. Uh, <laughs> what, what would you say? You just let them respond. Get a little journal. Write that down. Is it, maybe they'll use some words to write that through the Spirit, and that's a glorious thing. And maybe they won't. But take that into yourself. We're going we're to come back to it later. And let me just finally uh, conclude with some good news. Uh, we are actually not the gardener of our lives. And neither is no one else. God is the constant gardener of our lives. And in the Gospel of John, in the 15th chapter, uh, Jesus gives us another parable story about vines and vineyards and the expectation of fruit. Can you believe that? And he tells us this. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain and abide in me will bear fruit. Those who don't bear fruit, who's going to prune them off? My Father will prune off the branches that don't bear fruit. Who's the constant gardener in this parable? God, Jesus, yes. And the whole idea there, and th th this, is, this is where good news comes into this, right? Is if you abide in me, faithfulness precedes fruitfulness. If you abide in me and in this relationship and you stay connected to me, the, the life of the Spirit that flows through that vine and through us as branches, if we make that the, the central focus of our lives, the fruit will come. And sometimes it won't. And sometimes we won't be joyful, patient, um, generous people. Sometimes we'll be the opposite of those things. But Jesus says, if you abide in me, if you stay with me, if you make me the center of your life, you will bear fruit. And if you don't, my Father, my Father will turn off the branches that don't bear fruit. So we hold that truth together. There's an expectation that we're going to bear fruit. And there's the only one that can bear that fruit in our life is Jesus. And our relationship with Jesus is, is how we, we bear that fruit. Every time we come to this table, we have an opportunity to invite that constant gardener into our life in any way. And it's my hope that we get to come to the table and we get to do a little bit of a fruit inspection. So we get to look at those places of our lives and say, I think maybe I've been, been the fruits of death over here and I want to have the fruits of life. And Jesus tells us God is faithful. God is merciful. God is passive. He's unfailing love. And every time we come to the table, we say, Lord, here's, here's the fruits of my life. We invite God to do that gardening, to trim and prune out the things that need to go and to add the things that need to, to come. And the process of fertilization and cultivation and pruning, like nobody likes that process. Amen? Amen. Nobody likes to uh, have manure and be fertilized and cut and trimmed and then habits that we're really, really stuck in, mental attitudes that we really have been using our whole life. Now just saying, no, those aren't good for you, leave those behind. This is hard, challenging stuff. But there's, there's a reward. And the reward's really not about us. 
It's about the people that are going to taste those fruits and their lives are going to be changed. And then we actually, in Jesus' parable of the sower, become the sowers who are casting out the seeds generatively and peacefully so that those seeds are falling in the hearts of others where that gospel can grow and transform lives in our community. And the good news is this morning there's room at the table for all of us. There's room at the table for you. On that final night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the common loaf of bread, lifted it up on the disciples, and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Then he took the cup, lifted it up among them, and said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink all of you and do this always in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy sacrifice. In union with the mystery of the faith, let us proclaim it. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ is Lord. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father God, now and forevermore. I'll ask that you extend your hands with me as we consecrate the elements together. Holy Spirit, we pray that you pour out your power and spread in this cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus, that we may be the body and blood of Jesus in the world. Make us one, Lord. One in the unity of your spirit. One in our love for you and for each other. One in mission to all the world. And all God's people said. Amen. So this morning, uh, as we come and break the bread and dip it in the cup, there's this piece in the, the liturgy about the, the great reconciliation. And as we come and, and take the bread and dip it in the cup today, maybe you've heard some of the things that Paul had to say, you thought to yourself, you know, I've been envious or boastful or slanderous or any of those things. Um, I want to just ask you to take a step of faith this morning. And if, if there's someone in, in the congregation you need to be reconciled with um, or that, that you need to ask forgiveness from or that you want to just extend the hand of love, after we come to the table as forgiven and reconciled and healed people, who've been given this grace and love in Jesus Christ. I just ask that you go find somebody, extend the hand of reconciliation, forgiveness, love, and grace. Um, and maybe it's a relationship that needs to be amended or whatever that is. Find somebody and love on them and extend to them the forgiveness and grace that's been given to you. Amen. So we'll start this morning by teaching. Are there our ushers coming forward? The table in the United Methodist Church is an open table. That means all people are welcome. You don't have to be a Methodist or a denomination or persuasion. Um, but if you want to deepen your relationship with Jesus, this table is here for you. Uh, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, this is an opportunity to do that. As you come down and tear the bread, dip it in the cup, know that Christ died for you um, and wants to have a relationship with you. If you need some prayer, I'll be over here in the corner. I'd love to pray with you or if you have any needs. Just bring those to me. Come to the table of forgiveness and grace. 